Father, we recognize that the truth you have revealed in your word is very broad, very high, very deep. Sometimes, as human beings, we are beginning to just scratch the surface. In some cases, we find ourselves gaining more knowledge and at the same time, still overwhelmed and sometimes ending up in cul-de-sacs, in dead ends, not able to put it together. We know that you didn't reveal what you revealed as a wasted purpose. At the same time, truth is buried like gold and precious jewels and requires the extra effort to dig out those greater, deeper truths. Today we are attempting to understand your return, Lord Jesus. And as it is your return, we would ask that we in no way dishonor you knowingly, that we misrepresent what you have revealed. Give us understanding, strengthen our faith, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's begin reading today at First Thessalonians chapter 5. And notice, if you will please, First Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 1. But concerning the times and seasons, the prophetic times and seasons is what that term refers to. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Why no need? Because the Old Testament had revealed the day of the Lord, which he's about to talk about. In other words, what he's about to do is he's about to go back to Old Testament prophecy. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. I want you to notice the term, the day of the Lord. That is a term used in Scripture. It is prophetic. But it needs to be thoroughly, or not thoroughly, at least initially today, understood. Now turn back to Philippians chapter 1. And notice, if you will please, Philippians 1 and verse number 6. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue or complete it until, and notice this term, the day of Christ. Now, I realize that Christ is God and God is Christ, as it were. They're both part of the Godhead. But there are distinctions between God the Father and God the Son. For example, no one would ever say that God the Father died on the cross for us. We would say God the Son did. No one would say that God the Father has the role of dwelling in the believer. God the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes there are terms used in Scripture that have some crossing point, connection, or parallel, or are interrelated. And these two terms, as close as they are, to appreciate the text, you have to understand the difference. This is not soup. This is actually doctrine. So turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let me lay the groundwork to
to begin to draw that distinction today. 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm sorry, my mistake. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When he says that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night, if you know much about the rapture, we are told the rapture occurs as a thief in the night. And so because of that parallel, we get the whole prophetic picture confused. So I want to draw a distinction or several distinctions today. To appreciate that, let's go back to Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. There are a number of rules in how to interpret the Bible, and the Bible is always interpreted by itself. In your notes that I have handed out, I'm going to define the word day at this point. Notice Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 5. The Bible says, well, let's actually back up to verse 3 as God begins to work through creating. Then God said, let there be light. Literally, the Hebrew reads, God commanded light, not let there be. Light doesn't have its own source. This is from God. God said light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Would you notice, please, in this passage, Genesis 1-5, first of all, what is the definition of day? The first definition, because there are two. Uh, a period of time that includes the day and the night. No? Yeah? In verse number five, yeah. notice, if you will, please, God called the light day. Okay. Then it says this, and the darkness he called night. But then notice the same verse has another definition of day. So the evening and morning were the first day. So you say, what is the day? Well, the term day to us, I'm going to use a generalized term, it's when the sun is shining, when we see the light. So for right now, this time of year, we might say it's from 7.30 or 7 until 8 at night. But the term day can also mean 24 hours as it does on a calendar. And the evening and the morning are both day. Why is that important? Because the term day has a narrow meaning and it has a broad meaning. And when we read the day of Christ or the day of the Lord, we're not referring to a 12-hour period. We are referring to a period of time. And that period of time, in both cases, begins in the evening. Notice verse 5. It says, Genesis 1-5, And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I've listed on the notes and on the screen. We're not going back to look at it. But God told Israel how they were to count time. And the counting of time for Israel always began at sunset. For example, when does the Sabbath begin? Sunset on Friday. So, when you read in the Bible, listen carefully to this expression. The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Whatever the day of the Lord is about, it's coming with a period of darkness to begin with. And then it ends in a period of light. The term day of Christ also begins at the same second, at the same event. There is an event that triggers all of this together, and that event we read about last week in 1 Thessalonians 4. 
It is the rapture of the church. When God takes the church out, the world will be thrown into the greatest darkness ever in history. God will actually remove the church which has been carrying the strength of the Holy Spirit in this age. And this Holy Spirit, this next period of time, we call the tribulation. Hell is going to break loose. And that period is seven years in the Bible. Now, with that in mind, take your Bible and turn with me to Joel chapter 3. Joel is an Old Testament prophet, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Joel chapter 3. Joel is going to use this term, the day of the Lord, as well. Notice, if you will, please, Joel chapter 3. And let's begin a reading at Joel 3, verse 12. Joel says in Joel 3, verse 12, Let the nations be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Pause for a moment. Just so we know where we're talking about. Between the Mount of Olives and the temple in Jerusalem is a valley. That is the valley of Jehoshaphat. Listen to what I say. In Matthew 25, Jesus will judge the nations between the tribulation and the millennium. So this verse is parallel to Matthew 25, starting at verse 31. Now listen carefully. Let the nations be awakened and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow flow, for their wickedness is great. This is the wrath of God about to come on the nations. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What we realize is this. The day of the Lord is actually about the second coming. It specifically is referring to the second coming. It is not even referring to the church. That's why Joel writes about it, Old Testament. That's why Paul, when he writes to the Thessalonians, can tell them, you already know this. Because the only Bible the early church had was the Old Testament. So Paul is saying, I don't need to give you an understanding of the Old Testament. You have it in front of you. Now, turn, and I'm just laying some important groundwork. Turn to Isaiah 34 for just a moment. Back to the book of Isaiah, and we will not bury you in turning today. My goal is not to have a, uh, what is it? A Bible quiz where you have to open the Bible and find the passage. That is not my goal today. But it is important to understand the day of the Lord includes the judgment of the nations before the millennium in the valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel 3 and Matthew 25. The day of the Lord actually begins with wrath. Look at Isaiah chapter 34 and notice if you will Isaiah 34 beginning at verse 1 Isaiah 34 verse 1 says this come near you nations to hear and he you people let the earth hear and all that is in it the world and all things that come forth from it for the wrath of the Lord is against the nations. The indignation of the Lord is against the nation and His fury against their armies. He has utterly destroyed them and He has given them over to slaughter and their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses and the mountain shall be melted with their blood. This is all the judgment of God at the beginning of the day of the Lord. Drop down. You can 
read this entire passage, but in verse number 8, he summarizes all of this period of wrath and says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. So every time I read the term day of the Lord, the heart of it, not the calendar, the heart of it is wrath. It's all about judgment. It's all about God pouring out His justice on this rebellious world. And if I may say this for the moment, we'll expand this as we go on this morning, but if I may say this, it begins with the tribulation. The tribulation is the wrath of God. Read Romans, uh, Revelation chapter 6. So the whole tribulation is about wrath, and then the last three and a half years is about the greatest wrath that man will ever experience. Now look over at Isaiah chapter 35. And notice, if you will, Isaiah 35. Let's begin reading at verse number 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy singing the glory of heaven. Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and of Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. And you can read Isaiah 35. It is a description of the millennium. So we come from the judgment in chapter 34 to the millennium in chapter 35. So listen to how I state this. The day of the Lord includes the tribulation and it includes the millennium. Now turn to 2 Peter 3 and this will get easier in just a moment once I have laid a foundation. And I'll pause to see if there any, is any confusion. 2 Peter chapter 3 This is a passage that has been so abused so misused. Do you understand that the term general epistle is really Jewish epistle? When I read the book of James, the book of 1 Peter and 2 Peter, the book of Jude, and the writings of John, they are written to the Jews and will become very critical in the tribulation. There are things that are in the book of James that, for example, Paul preaches we're saved by faith alone. James comes along and says, you tell me you have faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. It almost sounds like a contradiction. And the reason for that distinction is because people during the tribulation period will claim to be saved. And the proof is, how much are you willing to turn to Christ and stand for the truth? Because the wrath of the Antichrist and the nations of the world is against you. That's why there's some distinctions in First and Second Peter. Well, when you come to Second Peter chapter 3, Notice, if you will, 2 Peter 3, and verse 9 is one of the most misinterpreted verses. Listen carefully. Second, I'm sorry, 8 and 9. In fact, I'm going to begin at verse 7. I have to. But the heavens and the earth, which are now reserved by the same word, are reserved, or preserved, pardon me, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment, underline it, and perdition of ungodly men. The day of judgment comes at the end of the day of the Lord. It is the day of the great white throne judgment. Then Peter goes on to say this, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, uh, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, 1,000 days, or pardon me, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 
That is not a reference to the fact that the days of creation were thousands of years. It is not a reference to time as we know it. It is a reference to the millennium. The millennium is a thousand years. That specifically is what Peter's talking about. He goes on to say this, looking at the people of Israel and the people of faith during the tribulation period, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, that is the believers, but that all should come to repentance in this period. And then he defines the period of a thousand years and where it goes. Verse 10, here's our term. But the day of the Lord will not come in, will not start, will not, pardon me, but the day of the Lord will come in, will be initiated, will start as a thief in the night. And how will it end? In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements melt with a fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So the day of the Lord is a term, not of a 24 hour day, but of a period of time. And you say, where does it begin and where does it end? Let me walk through it right now if you want to take note of this. It begins with the day of the day of when a thief comes in the night, which is the rapture, but it begins with the rapture. It is also the very moment when the nations of the world experience God's judgment. Listen to how I state this. What do my wife and I have in common about the day of our marriage and the day of intimacy? Think this through. Very simple. Is the day of our marriage over? No. The day of our marriage, of our wedding? Yeah, yes. That day is over. But something else that began there didn't end there, it went on. And that's why this is critical to understand this. The rapture of the church sends the world into chaos and the tribulation begins. So, the day of the Lord includes the seven-year tribulation, both the tribulation and the great tribulation. Coming out of that, we read in the book of Joel, it includes the judgment of the nations before the great millennium, and that's referred to in Matthew 25 as well. It includes the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. It also includes the final battle in Revelation chapter 20 when Satan is released and Gog and Magog come against Jesus Christ and then the great white throne judgment. All of that is the day of the Lord. It's grouped together under that one title. My wife and I are parents and marriage partners. Now, as marriage partners, it continues. As parents, our basic role of raising children ended many years ago. So when we refer to the day of the Lord, you have some things that we think of that aren't part of it, but the whole process includes all of this. Now, before I go any further, is that clear or do we need to explain that? I'm not asking if you could debate it, if you could refer to it and completely t tell me everything. You, you're comfortable with that. All right, now, turn back, if you will, please, to the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Keeping in mind what I said earlier, about the day of the Lord and the day of Christ start at the same time. They start at the same moment. Rapture, tribulation. Now, 
to say it starts at the same time does not mean the rapture occurs at 9 o'clock and the tribulation starts at noon. There may be a period of some days, some weeks, some months for the world to go over the chaos of all of a sudden millions of people have disappeared. The economy of the world is wrecked because first of all, in our world, legally speaking, the government will probably attempt to take our possessions yeah. from our families, yeah. but that's going to require some legal time. So to get the ball rolling, to get the engine rolling, may take some time. When you look at the Bible, when there's a major change, there's a period of time. I'll illustrate that. Noah was in the flood, and the earth settled for a period of time before Noah and the Noahic Covenant. Israel came out of Egypt from bondage, and then they rested at Mount Sinai till God gave the law. Jesus came to die for our sins, and before the church began, there's a period of 40 days till we get to Pentecost, and then there is a period of 10 more days before we get to the celebration of Pentecost. So transition is normal, but the home plate began to run the basis for both the day of Christ and the day of the Lord is the rapture. Look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and Paul says, beginning at verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For since we believe uh, that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, this is the spirits of those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now he's about to go back to John 14 and give a divine commentary. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. It's not rapture of living and the dead are still there. They're together because the church is a unit. For the Lord himself, and now the details, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be raptured together, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Notice, Jesus never returns to earth when he gets the church to the air. He only returns to the earth at the second coming. Hold your place here and turn back to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah, in the Old Testament, Zechariah, even though it's not considered a large book, it is one of the greatest books to clarify the second coming. And remember, the second coming is about Jesus returning to the earth. Notice, if you will, verse 1, chapter 14. Zechariah, chapter 14, let's begin reading in verse number 1. Zechariah 14, 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather the nations to battle against Jerusalem. This is Armageddon, this is tribulation. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city will go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight among those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. And let me stop. In the day of the Lord, Jesus returns to the earth. The church, the day of Christ, he never touches the earth. So what I want to show you is in the coming charts some contrasts between these terms. Because the day of Christ, notice, if you will, in the third of our uh, PowerPoint, 
notes. First of all, I've listed the day of Christ. He comes in the air, verses 16 and 17, for his saints and believers leave the earth. He gathers his own. In the day of the Lord, this is a contrast. He comes to the earth, not just in the air. He actually comes to the earth and fights battle. And let me say this, if you carefully read the Bible, this is a little bit amazing to read this in the Bible. But when Jesus returns, there is going to be a battle that is going to be 1,400, if I remember right, furlongs, 186 miles from the Valley of Jezreel all the way to Petra. And that final battle, he comes to the earth, Zechariah 14 says. But secondly, notice he comes with his saints. That's exactly what we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He came for them, now he comes back with them. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew 24. In the rapture, in the day of Christ, he takes the saints out of this world before he pours his wrath out on this world. In Matthew chapter 24, notice, if you will, please, verse 36. Verse 36 says this, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. That day and hour that he's about to talk about is not the day of Christ. I would write over Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 in my Bibles, Jewish and tribulation. There is no church in this passage. This is Jewish prophecy. Here's what the disciples ask. Now listen carefully. Matthew 24, 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and the disciples came to him, uh, came to, uh, uh, came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not See all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That is not referring to A.D. 70. It is not referring to the Crusades. It is referring to the Tribulation. This whole passage is about the Tribulation. What's the verse again? Verse 2. Okay. Now verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what will be the sign of what? That's to the earth. They're not asking about the rapture. That's not even on their mind. Please, in order to appreciate the Bible, I want to interpret it right and I want to apply it right. But I cannot apply it right if I don't interpret it right. The disciples didn't even comprehend a rapture. Until Paul comes along, nobody has clarified the rapture. It's not even been a subject to discuss. The only thing that the Jews knew, Daniel 9, there's going to be seven years of tribulation. And then Isaiah and Zechariah tell us there's going to be a reign of Christ on the earth. They don't even know it's going to be a thousand years. The only time you know it's a thousand years is when Peter introduces the idea and John in Revelation. Up until then, you ask, what's, what's your prophecy chart? Two words, tribulation, millennium, end. That would be it. So when we come to this passage, they're not asking about the rapture. They're not asking about the day of Christ. They're asking about the day of the Lord. Now drop down, if you will, please. You have a question? Well, yeah, you want me to save it to the end? Well, let me finish this, and then it's not the end, but we'll stop after okay. this. Look in verse number 36 again. Um, this is often preached 
to Christians about the rapture. And it's not. Listen carefully. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in the marriage act, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. For, pardon me, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Pause. Remember this. The day of Christ is about the church. The day of the Lord, Israel, and the nations of the world. Tribulation to millennium. Now here's my question. Let's go back to the days of Noah. How are the days of Noah like the day of the Lord? Because we're in the tribulation. So we're in the day of the Lord. Who was taken away in the days of Noah? Noah and his family were not taken. All the people outside the ark. Everyone who was not in the ark. Everyone in the ark didn't go through the destruction. Unbelievers were taken. This is not a passage about believers. This is a passage about unbelievers removed because the church and those saved in the tribulation go into the millennium. Those who are unbelievers are taken away. And so he says this, verse 40, two men will be in the field. One will be taken away, the other left to go into the millennium. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken away in judgment. The other, as it were, left to go into the millennium. Watch therefore, for you do not know how what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. That is the second coming. It is not the rapture. Now I'll take your question. Okay, so now my question is, I pre when I present that to somebody, here's a, a question that came up, and I don't know how to answer it. How do you explain, we're in the worst period ever, you know, uh, starvation, millions of, you know, billions of people dying. War, chemical warfare. But how do you explain that two are in the field grinding at the mill and working in the field? That's the argument. Well, that seems like everyday well, life. So the question is, how do we understand they're working in the field? How do we understand Let, let me ask you a question. With... Let me ask you a question. Yes. Let's think this through. Okay. That they're telling you that's illogical. Yes. Okay, and I'm going to ask you this question. If you were to have warfare that went on like it does in the tribulation period, and you were to consume in warfare what would be known as the supplies needed to take a nation, an army, and fight. If you destroyed the oil, you would be back to an agrarian economy. The whole world's economy is going to be wrecked. And all you have to do is read Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 16. This is a simplistic world at that time. But more importantly, when Jesus said this, Jesus could not say, as a man's driving his Cadillac, his wife is taken out of his Cadillac. The disciples would have said, what's a Cadillac? They couldn't even comprehend that. His point is by way of illustration, two are doing something, two are doing nothing, and side by side you have removal. All of the unrighteous are taken, take a magnet, with the rapture, you take all the righteous, the saved, to heaven. With the second coming, you take all of the unrighteous and you take them straight to hell. They are making that an argument of what? Ignorance of the Bible? What's their point? I'm not sure, but for me, I see their argument as really a straw man argument. Yeah, well, and many, many, many people including pastors and Bible teachers that I've listened to will say that this is a rapture verse. Sure they are. And they're wrong. I wouldn't care if everybody said it. They're still wrong. Oh, I, I agree with you. 
Well, well, even if you don't agree with me, I'd say you're wrong. <laughs> because those taken are taken in judgment. They're destroyed. Andy Wood says that too. <sighs> okay, so if this is not about the rapture, then what's it talking about once taken and once left? Put yourself, if you know Bible prophecy, at the end of the tribulation. You are at the end of the tribulation and you're about to begin the millennium. Between the two, there is the judgment of the nations. And at that judgment, people standing beside one another, nations beside one another, are removed from the face of the earth, straight to hell. They are taken to the second death. They're taken possibly by the first death. I don't even think that what we call the first death, the spirit leaves the body. I think they're consigned to hell and the technicalities are not clear. I will say this, Zechariah tells us that when Jesus returns, John says a word goes out of his mouth and kills the nation. Zechariah says their body will literally, if you've ever seen the movie Raiders of the Ark, when they open the Ark of the Covenant and the body, the flesh, melts right off of them, that is what Zechariah says will take place when Jesus gives the command as He returns at His second coming. But this is a judgment passage. Now, let me add to that. If you read Matthew 25, Matthew 25 expands that judgment. Notice, if you will, the kingdom of heaven shall be like the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. The ten virgins, picture Israel, five were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But though the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps. And let me pause. What is oil symbolic of in the Bible? Spirit. Holy Spirit. So in other words, half the Jews in his parable. Half the Jews do not have the Holy Spirit and half do. And the half that don't are unsaved and they will be sent. They are taken away. Drop down, if you will, please. Another parable, another way of illustrating the second coming. The kingdom of heaven, verse 14, is like a man traveling in a far country and uh, who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Drop down. You, mo you probably know this, but drop down if you will, please. And uh, I can't bypass it all. <laughs> Let's continue reading. Verse 16, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with that traded with them, made five other talents. Likewise, who had received two, two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And the long story short, the man with five that got ten, rewarded. The man with two that got five, rewarded. The man that had one didn't. What's the point? This is the judgment of the nations. Talents here is not about money. This is how this passage is preached. But it's not really a money passage. Jesus is using money to illustrate truth. If I put $50 in your hands and I say, here's $50, spend it wisely. And I come back a month later and I ask, how did you spend it? How did you spend it? How did you spend it? If it's my money, I'm holding you account of what? Stewardship. This is not about money, but about the truth in the tribulation period. Because in the tribulation period, truth is going to disappear. It will be, it's worse than we have today. Today will be like a vacation compared to what the Bible describes. My point being, nations and people that did not hold the truth they are taken away. Then Jesus finally draws the conclusion, these words in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Pause. 
This is not the great white throne judgment. Let me show you some contrast. If I can have your face a moment, your attention, because you're focused on the text, and I am going to read it. In the great white throne judgment, all the dead stand before God. And those who stand before God, the Bible tells us, their end is they're cast into the lake of fire. These people are not included when he comes on the throne of his glory on earth, which is his millennial kingdom. He is about to expel nations or people who actually have not accepted him as the Christ, his word as the will of God and the living reality of God, and therefore have fought Israel, the holder of truth. Let me illustrate it. Look at chapter 25, and notice, if you will, verse 32. Underline some key words. All the, what? Nations. All the nations gather before him. And he'll separate one from another as a sheep divides his sheep from the goats. And he'll say to his sheep on his right hand, pardon me, he'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, who are those in verse 34? They're on his right hand. Sheep. Sheep. Sheep coming out of the tribulation. He says to them, listen to what he says. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then what's the reason? Listen to this reason. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me, and I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in? Or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, pause. Inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let me ask you a question. In the church, what gets a person into heaven? Trusting Christ as Savior. Has nothing to do with who we feed, who we clothe, who we help that's sick. Not saying they're not important. It's not the basis of judgment. The basis of judgment here is not about heaven. This is about going into the millennium. These people cannot even enter the millennium because they are so evil, and that's a distinction he is drawing. You're not going into the millennium because of how you treated my brethren. Well, who are my brethren? It can't be Christians. Christians are in heaven. It's only saved people during the tribulation period, the Jews and Gentiles that believe. This is a judgment of people individually and collectively to get them into the millennium. Then he says, notice if you will, then he'll say to those on the left hand who couldn't answer yes, that's all the goats. Depart from me, you curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he gives us the same reasoning. Verse 46, these go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Because, I want you to listen how I say this, eternal life is life without end. Those who come out of the tribulation, who have trusted Christ, Jew or Gentile, they will go into the millennium, but they go in as believers. Now here's what's different. When they go in as believers, they go in with their natural body. That's how the whole world gets repopulated. And that is how you have people at the end of the millennium that are willing to turn on Christ. Because this is a natural. 
Christ in the millennium is showing what creation was supposed to be in the garden. And in spite of seeing that, knowing the saints of the ages, knowing the saints on the earth who are ruling his kingdom, mankind still rebels. God is showing man his problem is never his circumstances, it's his heart. Now, we're making such good progress. <laughs> Let me take questions first of all, and I'll finish this screen. I don't know what I'll do. I'll go 10 more minutes and then we'll quit. Um, do you have any questions? Am I clear? That's my main thing. Anything you need me to clarify? I don't think so. You answered my question. And you answered another question that I had when I wrote it down without me asking you. Okay. As you were talking. <laughs> okay. All right, looking on the screen then, let me do these comparisons. And it's basically the passages. When Jesus returns for the church at the rapture, he gathers his own. In Matthew 24, unbelievers are taken, but notice the angels gather them together. Verse 31, it's not Jesus. It's the angels that gather them. That's a big distinction between the church and the second coming. Look again, if you will, at these contrasts. He comes, 1 Thessalonians 4, to reward those who are his believers. It's not a judgment. The judgment of the Christian is not for sin. It's for rewards. And it has no signs. Therefore, you'll hear the term imminent. All imminent means there's not a sign for the rapture. And it's a message of comfort. And you know what? I'm not going to finish this purposely because I'm opening up so many things. That Matthew 25, he comes not to reward but to judge. While the rapture has no signs, the tribulation period gives many signs of the second coming after the tribulation period. Wherefore, where the day of Christ is to comfort the church, 2 Thessalonians 2, which is the second epistle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, his coming is to judge. And there are seven judgments at the end of the tribulation period. The church is about believers, but in Matthew 24, you still have nations, Jews and the Gentile nations. And I ask just one question. Do you have any questions? Because I'm going to come back here next week. I'm getting a little lost in all this. I'm glad. <laughs> okay. It's perfectly okay. So, the rapture. Okay. Christians are taken out. Are we judged at that time? While the tribulation goes on on earth, ask me this question next week. I'll okay. answer it. I'll show you the text. The Christians in heaven are rewarded. Okay. Their sin is never judged. It's already been judged at Calvary. So they are rewarded for the quality, not amount, mm -hmm. quality of the service. And I'll talk about that next okay. week. So basically... Wait a minute. I, I, oh, I sorry. No, I don't want her to get lost because she's... I'm I lost. know you are. I just... Okay. Now... Do you have a follow-up question or comment? Does that settle anything? Or some yeah. warning you still have 99 others? <laughs> <laughs> so, all the believers are taken out at the rapture. And then you have the tribulation. And there will be people who were not believers by the rapture who will believe during the tribulation. That is correct. Okay. And the, okay. Yes. Now I'm going to tell you why they'll believe. Someone says, if you take everybody out, no one to talk to them, how do they believe? Yeah. There are two things that go on. Okay? Number one, I am convinced the rapture itself is going to be the biggest awakening to people who are 
half in, half out. Mm -hmm. It's the Jews who have been so adamant against Christ. That is their history. And God has let it continue. He has never softened as a nation. Jews occasionally are saved, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. But as a group, they're not massively saved. But the greatest number of Jews ever to be saved will start with the tribulation and go through the millennium. It will be the greatest revival in world history. And it will flow out of the Jews who turn in mass. God sets aside at the beginning of the tribulation, Revelation 7, 12,000 Jews in every single tribe, 12 tribes, 144,000 Jews who are in essence the evangelists to start preaching the gospel. Okay. Moses and Elijah return to earth okay. and preach for three and a half years. And so those things together are how everybody gets it. Okay. But remember, the environment, I would not be surprised if the Bible will actually be illegal and only among Jews in their enclaves will it exist because the Gentile nations are going to be as atheistic as they can be. That's why when I see our nation turning atheistic, it doesn't alarm me because I understand this prophetic hope. Mm -hmm. And you can't have it just disappear one day. It has to basically gradually disappear. So I see the nation getting ready for the tribulation. That's how I interpret yeah. it. And I may go to my grave wrong, mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to go to my rapture right. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. But so, basically, what, I mean, and, and he, I, there was a, there's a, a high school teacher at Indian Rocks, and he, when he said, he said to the class, he said, for believers, that our theology is Romans through Philemon. And is what? Romans through Philemon. I think he said Romans yes. through Philemon. I he agree. said, as a believer, he said, if you look into any of the other books and try to insert yourself in there, he said, it'll mess you up. I he agree with that. Here's what Patty just asked. Looking at the New Testament, when we pick up the New Testament epistles, the Gospels give us a historical record affirming the deity of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, giving us confirmation of the Savior, and Acts initiates the church going into the world. Now, as believers, where do we generally find our home? I've told people for years and years and years, don't worry about the Old Testament. You're not going to master the Bible if you don't have many years to master it. I've often said, if you're going to master the Bible, master the New Testament. But if you're going to master the New Testament, you have to master the writings of Paul. And the writings of Paul are clearly from Romans to Philemon. Some would question the book of Hebrews. But Hebrews is generally grouped among the general epistles, and there is a reason. Jews, feasts, temple, tabernacle, sacrifice, and Hebrews builds on that, and so do all of the general epistles. So the general epistles give them confirmation coming out of Judaism. It's a better bridge for them. It is a big bridge to jump for a Jew from Old Testament to Romans. Yeah. That's too big of a bridge, but Hebrews is a better bridge, and that's exactly how the New Testament is written. All right? Also, if, if, if they had received Jesus Christ at the first coming, then they would have gone through tribulation and then the millennium at that time, correct? If the nation had received it, yeah. that is correct. Gotcha. Okay. Jesus offered the kingdom to Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, 56, he ended his offer to Israel and gave us 13, gave us Matthew 13, the parables from the first coming to the second coming. All those parables cover basically a period of history now, 2,000 years plus. And this kingdom 
will be preached. What he preached will be preached around the world and then the end will come. Because people often say, oh, he can't come, the rapture can't happen because the gospel hasn't been preached around the world yet. That's another argument. Let's bow our heads in prayer and I don't mind talking on the <laughs> tape. Father, thank you that our Lord is coming. We know that this wrath that you have promised is not something we have just stumbled on. It has always been, as we humanly say, somewhere is your rounding toward third base. The world will face it, and you will further glorify yourself. And your plan is always the best plan. So regardless of how much we struggle, and how many hurdles we see, and how much we do not understand, when we stand in eternity, we will look back and praise you for your wonderful plan. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.